welcome to this interview. My name is Glenn Holton. I am speaking today with Michael Yogg, author of the new book, Passion for Reality. It's about Paul Cabot, a pioneer of the mutual fund industry. In 1920s Boston, Cabot co-founded State Street Investment Corporation, one of the first open-ended mutual funds. He shepherded that fund through frenzied markets, the crash of 1929, and into the Great Depression. As Washington turned to investigating and then regulating the fledgling mutual fund industry, Cabot played a central role. The book does more than tell Cabot's story. It gives us a front row seat on the emergence of this important industry. Michael Yogg, welcome. It is a pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak to your uh, audience. Let's start with historical context. Open-ended mutual funds emerged in the 1920s. Before then, if investors didn't want to research individual stocks or bonds for their portfolios, what alternative did they have? Well, Paul Cabot's father was uh, what was called a Boston trustee. He was an investor in stocks and real estate. He happened to be a lawyer, although it was not necessary for trustees to be lawyers. And he basically was a financial advisor and he did uh, analyze and pick stocks for his clients. So I think that uh, certainly around Boston, among people that were upper middle class and above, that was the logical choice. There also were uh, closed end funds that you could invest in, and there were investment advisors like Scudder Stevens and Clark and Loomis Sales, and even they had some funds that were sort of pool pooled funds of their clients. But the main one for the wealthy and the near wealthy, and those were the people that owned stocks, uh, were the, uh, the Boston trustees or financial advisors. I see. How far back did the closed end funds go? Have they existed for some time or they were a new innovation as well? Well, in London, uh, well, in, I believe they started in Belgium around the middle of the 19th century. They became, oh. po became popular in London. Uh, sometimes called the Scottish Investment Trust, sometimes called the British Investment Trust, starting around 1880. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the U.S., uh, sometime after that, I don't have the date on that, but late 19th, early 20th century. Okay. So State Street was one of the first three open-ended mutual funds. Uh, tell us about State Street and tell us about its two competitors. Well, the, the three original, let me clarify one thing. Uh, State Street was the first open-end mutual fund to have money in it and to be <laughs> operating. Uh, Massachusetts Investors Trust, which is now part of Mass Financial Services, they were the first one to be legally chartered. So they like to say that they were first, but they didn't have any money <laughs> and they were not operating. So I, th I, I think of State Street as the first Paul Cabot and his two partners uh, started that in uh, July of 24. Mm -hmm. uh, so you asked me about what was it about the funds? It was special. Really two things. They were called Boston type and open end. Open end means that shares were issued. If you wanted to buy in, they'd issue you shares. And if you wanted to sell out, they would redeem the shares, buy back the shares. So that was open-end. It was not a closed-end fund that once you were in, you were in and you had to sell the thing, whatever the price was. You could actually redeem your shares at net asset value. And uh, so that's an important feature. The other thing about them is they were Boston type. And what this meant, that there was one class of shares, all shareholders were equal. There were no preferred shares versus common shares. There was no debt. Uh, there no public investors buying debt. There could be margin debt. Uh, and I'm sure, if you think about it logically, uh, if you had an open-end feature, you could only have one class of shares because if the equity holders could redeem, then the debt holders weren't really senior mm -hmm. to the equity holders. So the two concepts, open-end and Boston type, go together. That, that was we. So you're saying that they, with, with, with one of these Boston type funds, you wouldn't have a common shares and preferred shares. Right. Now, I, I think <laughs> initially, didn't Paul's company have uh, voting rights only for him and his two partners? So in that sense, they started off with a difference. That, that is true. Uh, for a couple of years, 
there was a difference in the shares voting versus non-voting, but economically and financially, all the shares were exactly the same. You know, reading the book, it, it's kind of fascinating because you know you, you sort of see that you know the, the Boston style open ended mutual fund, it, it didn't just emerge wholly formed. There were these precursors, there, there were these trusts, there were the closed end funds, and then you know Paul and his two partners they were experimenting initially. They did have you know voting shares for themselves and not for anybody else. Um, other, otherwise, there was no distinction in the shares. And you know over time, you you sort of see this um, concept emerging. And you know, becoming gradually the you know the the the, the modern open ended mutual funds that we know today, which I think was you know really fascinating. So, well, I, I think I can say that I'm oversimplifying a little bit, and okay. for the de for the details, you have to read the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, now you you asked me. I think maybe you're asking me a two part question. What was special about the Boston funds? And were you also asking how did State Street differ from the other two, or is that a Yes, because you've, you've mentioned the MIT fund, and that what, was right. the, what was the third fund? Uh, Incorporated Investors, which was acquired by Putnam, so now it's called the Putnam Investors Fund. Mm -hmm. and they it's, a, it's actually, actually uh, the Putnam Investors Fund is older than Putnam. Okay, and, um, and, and that one came a little bit later than the first two. Oh, uh, about a year. About a year. What, what in particular is noteworthy about State Street? Why, why do you focus on that one? I think State Street is notable because they were the first to really focus on fundamental securities research. And I believe that they were the first to really get on the train and go to New York and go to Chicago and go to Cleveland and sit down in the CEO's office and really find what was going on. Mm -hmm. So this gave them a tremendous research advantage. Some of it, by today's ethical standards in today's laws, might be considered inside information. Yeah. But in the in the nineteen twenties, it uh, it was not questioned. Yes, uh, actually, uh, th those practices were affirmed in the Massachusetts Supreme Court, yeah. and it led to extraordinary performance. So the biggest difference between State Street and the other two was performance. Yeah, and the reason for the performance was the intensity of the fundamental research. Mm -hmm. Now, incorporated investors also did uh, some research, uh, but they were not quite as successful. Mass, mass Financial or Mass Investors Trust at the beginning was really essentially an index fund. I mean, they had 120 uh, f uh, holdings in the portfolio. They didn't do any research. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and so so uh, State Street's advantage was huge. Then, of course, in the 30s, more and more people were doing the same type of research. When you're doing fundamental research, the fewer people that do it, the more valuable it is. As more and more people are copying you, it's not quite as valuable. So they, they had really strong performance. You can kind of see why. I mean, this, is, this, this was a fairly inefficient market because there wasn't a lot of information out there. You didn't have the SEC at this point requiring certain disclosures, so the Disclosures which were made were not uniform and certainly not as complete as we expect today. Because you just, didn't have you didn't have an SEC. You didn't have it precisely. So you know that that just didn't exist. So you, know, you have a less efficient market, and you have these guys going out and actually visiting the co companies and meeting the CEOs, and uh, you know it, it, not surprisingly they performed well. Tell us about the performance early on. How how, how strong was it? Well, in the nineteen twenties, uh, the compound annual. Uh, appreciation of the fund was 40%, and the, uh, the market was about 15%. <laughs> and uh, the other two funds were a little better than the market, but nothing remotely close to 40%. Yeah. But then, then in the 1930s, other people were doing the same type of research, so their advantage over the market was 3.3%. Yes. Then in the 1940s, they had even more competition, so their advantage over the market was uh, 1.5 percent, but this is after fees. Uh, it's actually 1.5 percent better than the market after fees is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Paul Cabot. Uh, he was a Boston Brahmin. Um, what did that mean in the 1920s? Tell us about his family. Well, the Boston Brahmins, including the Cabots, uh, they were the descendants of the original and the early uh, settlers in Massachusetts. They were uh, successful in trade. Boston had a lot of successful businesses, trade and manufacturing. 
you know, starting out, you know, you know the China trade uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, textiles. Uh, of course, the Lowells were famous for the textiles, not the Cabots. The Cabots were famous for more uh, shipping and during the Revolutionary War privateering. Um, and, you know, they were prominent in all the uh, industries that were uh, important to Boston from, uh, you know, up to technology, uh, you know, Charles Francis Adams III or whatever, uh, and, you know, mini computers and investment management. So the Boston Brahmins were wealthy, upper class, successful, frugal. Uh, they had certain social conventions, a lot of clubs. Uh, some of them were associated with Harvard. Uh, two other things that are very important have, have to do with Boston. So it primarily affected the Boston Brahmins because they had the money. Uh, Massachusetts law was favorable toward trusts. And Massachusetts securities law was favorable toward investing in stocks, in equities. The uh, uh, a law by uh, Justice Samuel Putnam called the prudent man rule allowed uh, trustees, fiduciaries to invest in stocks basically if they acted the way other prudent men, careful men would in those circumstances. So stock investing got a head start in Boston versus New York and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So in other jurisdictions, if you had a trustee investing in stocks and they did not perform well, he might face a lawsuit for mismanaging the money, but that wasn't a risk in Boston because of the prudent man rule. Is, is that the situation? I would say it was much less of a risk. I mean, it's, if you're irresponsible, you're irresponsible. But the burden of proof, I'm not a lawyer, yes. but it was a lot more difficult to sue someone for risky investments in Massachusetts than in New York or Pennsylvania. And then, to, as, as we saw, Boston became the center for money management, starting with the, these three mutual funds. Not, not today anymore, unfortunately, but for, for quite some time. And you're sort of giving us the roots of why that would be. Um, many, of, many of the mutual fund pioneers, including Paul Cabot, were the sons or grandsons or great-grandsons of trustees who invested in real estate and equities and bonds. So their families were already in the business. They knew it already. Right. Uh, did, I, I suppose being a Boston Brown and open doors, like you, you, give one, you, you tell one story in the, in the book where Paul Cabot wanted to meet with uh, President Roosevelt. Uh, he requested a meeting. Uh, he didn't even have to say what the meeting was about. And he got the, the meeting. I, I don't think that door would be open for all of us. Uh, was that because he was a Boston Brahmin? Uh, there were a lot of reasons. Uh, he had some directors at State Street uh, that were at State Street Bank, which was a much bigger institution. Uh, they opened some doors. Uh, Roosevelt knew the Cabot family. Uh, Paul Cabot and both of his partners were members of the Porcellian Club at Harvard, which I guess is a big deal. I was not a Harvard undergraduate, but uh, uh, people are sometimes impressed by that. And uh, so he, when he was quite young in the 1930s, he did meet President Roosevelt. He was not, Paul was not, Paul Cabot was not a Democrat by any means, uh, but he got through to him, got his message across and got help from Roosevelt. Uh -huh. Even before the 1929 crash, Paul Cabot was speaking out against abuses in the mutual fund industry, both open-end and closed-end mutual funds. Uh, this was a period of limited regulation. I mean, you know, before the 1929 crash, the stock market was really not regulated, certainly at the, not, not the federal level. The mutual fund industry was fledgling. It wasn't really regulated. Tell us about some of the specific abuses which Cabot was warning about prior to the 1929 crash. Uh, some of them were before the crash. Some of them were after, but it was okay. about the same time. It was before the secure, before the New Deal, let's say. Uh, he was uh, well. He was concerned about price manipulation. These clo especially the closed end funds. Well, I suppose you may be able to do it in open end fund as well. Uh, the closed end funds would sometimes sell their winners, take profits on the good ones, and maybe obscure or confuse the price on the losers. So that would inflate the price of the mutual fund. They could bring in new investors at inflated prices, which would improve the situation of the existing uh, investors. So all kinds of price manipulation was probably the number one thing he focused on. Another thing he hated was really, really complicated and confusing prospectuses and, uh, and annual reports and other financial documents. 
And I draw a parallel between uh, 1998, when long-term capital management tried to enlist Warren Buffett to help them out. And Warren Buffett was studying their disclosure documents. And he just <laughs> you know, threw his hand up through the papers around the room. I can't understand this. And, and, and Paul Cabot in, in the 30s would be reading some of his competitors, uh, some of the closed end, um, I guess it was in the 20s, excuse me, some of the closed end uh, reports and trying to figure out how they divided up their money among the common shareholders and the preferred and different types of preferred and the debt holders. Yeah. And, and he concluded that it was deliberate obfuscation to confuse uh, the shareholder so they could do whatever they want. No one would understand it. Another problem was uh, if you had a fund associated with an investment bank, they would do an underwriting. They couldn't sell out the underwriting. They'd stuff the unsold shares into the mutual fund. Uh, he told a story where uh, he was interviewed about taking on another fund, merging it into his fund. Or, no, he's, he's interviewed about managing a fund for that was run by a brokerage investment bank mm. and he asked oh, i see you have such and such in your portfolio could i sell this and and buy its competitor and the guy said well not necessarily this is part of our overall operation and if this hurt our investment banking blah 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 so he's concerned about his number one concern he was a fiduciary his number one concern was taking care of his clients mm -hmm. and uh of course, part of that was because he generally owned about 3% of the fund himself. I mean, he had all of his money in his own mutual fund. Yes. So he was taking care of himself, taking care of his clients. Uh, what the point is, there was no conflict of interest between himself and his clients because all of his money, all of his children's money, all of his siblings' money, all of his friends' money, they're all in there together. Yes. But, th but those are the type of abuses. Uh, confusion... Uh, stuffing securities into a portfolio, price manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also, later on, he was very concerned about uh, takeovers, uh, uh, the uh, conglomerates in the 60s, uh, how they manipulated earnings. They took over companies to increase reported earnings, things like that. Okay. How did State Street perform in 1929? I mean, a lot of banks, a lot of funds uh, you know, went under uh, in, the, in the Great Crash. Uh, what was uh, State Street's experience? Well, the short answer is in 1929, they were down 5.7%, and the market was down 12 for the calendar year on a total return basis. Okay. So they went down about half as much as the overall market. Of course, um, you know, October, November, December was a little worse than that, but for the year as a whole, which is what I have the number for. Okay. Uh, but... They didn't do that great, really. They were, um, they were trying to time the market, and they were in and out and in and out. And in my opinion, they were pretty darn lucky. They, hap they happened to be defensively postured uh, at the time of the crash, so that really helped them because the cash didn't go down, only the stocks went down. Mm -hmm. But uh, they didn't really know what was going on. I mean, they, they said, you know, uh, they, they said... Uh, in the annual report of 29, which came out probably in February, they said, well, you know, things are down a lot, but, you know, we're a little worried about a depression, and we could have a depression that might last a year or two. Okay. Uh, so he was worried, and he was right to be worried, but he had no idea that this was as serious as it was. Mm -hmm. So he was in and out of the market so much, his timing was good, but my honest opinion, there was some luck involved. Okay. That's, that's, that wasn't market timing was not the key to a success. It was stock picking. Okay. But in 1929, it was market timing. Yes. Uh, okay, after the crash, heading into the 1930s, Cabot spent a lot of time in Washington as Congress investigated the mutual fund industry and then started drafting important le legislation. Tell us about this period. Well, I th there were two very important pieces of legislation that Paul Cabot was involved in. Uh, the first was the Revenue Act of 1936, and the second was the Investment Company Act of 1940. The reason the Revenue Act was important was because there was an issue of the taxation of mutual fund dividends. 
Now, the way things are now, mutual fund owns the stock. The stock pays the dividend. The mutual fund takes the dividend and passes it on to the ultimate shareholder. And when the mutual fund company... Without being taxed. Right. So the mutual fund does not pay tax. When the mutual fund company passes on the dividend, it also passes on the tax obligation. In the mid-30s, and particularly the Revenue Act of 35, uh, there was a small tax to the mutual fund. It was uh, a 90% exclusion, and it was a 15% tax. So it was 15% tax on 10%. It was a 1.5% tax. It wasn't that bad, but it set a precedent. And Cabot and... um, Merrill Griswold, the head of Mass Financial, and uh, Tudor Gardner, the head of Incorporated Investors, they were quite concerned. And although they had been competitors and sometimes fighting tooth and nail, they got together on this one. They went down together. They lobbied uh, uh, Senator Walsh of Massachusetts. They went all through the administration. And there are a lot of funny stories about this in the book. Uh, They met with Roosevelt. Uh, They had some trouble with Treasury. Roosevelt straightened out the trouble with Treasury. And in the end, they got a bill, Revenue Act 1936, where as long as the mutual fund company paid out the dividends to the shareholders, at least 95%, they wouldn't have to pay any tax. If they had been subject to double taxation, they would not have been able to compete with uh, private uh, investment advisors. So that was very important, and it really was an example of Paul Cabot's strong will. Wouldn't take no for an answer. You actually, knew- you actually see through this process that he's continuing to shape the mutual fund industry. You know, mm-hmm. he's been shaping how, how it would perform, how it would be structured, what the practices would be. And now he's in Washington effectively shaping the legislation, in this case the tax legislation, which would make the, the, the mutual funds continue to be possible. The other big piece of legislation was the 1940 Act. Why don't you tell us about that? The 1940 Act was extremely important. It wasn't that important uh, for the mutual funds in the end because they were down there lobbying. But but basically, in the 20s, there were terrible practices uh, practiced by both the closed-end funds and even maybe some of the open-end funds. And then with the crash, things were cleaned up. And then as soon as the crash was over, these abuses started appearing again. People got quite concerned. And so there was this mutual fund, uh, SEC investigation in the mutual funds. It was supposed to be from 35 to 36. It actually was from 35 to 39. Mm -hmm. And out of this came a piece of legislation that codified behavior and practices for the mutual fund. And the fact is, because the Boston funds were pretty much on the up and up, it sort of codified what they were doing Mm -hmm. and and forced their competitors to do the same thing, that, that everybody was on the same playing field, everyone obeyed the same rules. So even though it was a tiny bit restrictive to Paul Cabot and his fund and his Boston competitors, it was more restrictive to the people who were doing more funny things under the table. Okay. But he was very active and actually was very praised by um, particularly the Democrats in Congress, uh, Bob Wagner of New York and people like that. Mm-hmm. You knew Paul Cabot personally. Uh, tell us how you knew him. Uh, uh, tell us about the man you knew. I, I'm sorry. What was the last part? Tell, uh, us. Tell, tell us how you knew Paul uh, and tell us about Paul, the, the man that you knew. Oh, oh the man that I knew. Yeah. Well, I went to work for his company in 1978, so really right before his 80th birthday, and he was pretty good shape at that time. And uh, so he lived another 16 years from then, and he came into the office on a regular basis for 16 years. Uh, Initially, he came in almost every day except for the summer. And as he got older, I mean, starting from age 80 to age 96, you get a little older, so he came in uh, less frequently, but you'd still see him a couple of times a month. Mm -hmm. And he knew that I was interested in history, and he talked to me sometimes about that, and then before before he died, he did give me some papers, some interviews, and some personal papers. And of course, after that, that whetted my appetite, and I got a lot more. Wow, that's quite a story. From his children and from the company. Uh-huh. 
you were still working at State Street when it was sold to Metropolitan Life. Tell us about that experience. Oh, Metropolitan Life uh, was sold fairly early in my career. I joined the company in 78. Uh, the transaction really took place in 82, the closing in January of 83. Mm -hmm. So most of my time at State Street uh, was uh, under the ownership of Metropolitan Life. Uh, Metropolitan Life, uh, there were some excellent people and there were some good people. But basically, uh, because of the transaction, the firm went from a private partnership where the professionals were working, the younger professionals were working to become partner and have a share of the profits and just a piece of the action and the excitement to all of a sudden it's the subsidiary of a mutual life insurance company, a huge one in New York. So that affected morale of, him. well, the partners, their morale was pretty good because it was sold for, uh, well, what ended up to be out $100 million. Yeah. So, I, so the, the partners, most of the partners were pretty happy, and, but they had, even though they had contracts, most of them didn't stay very long. The people who were looking forward to being partners were pretty discouraged, and a lot of the clients were uh, worried, and maybe most important, future employees, business school students, uh, were looking uh, at various uh, employment options, and State Street didn't look quite as good as part of Metropolitan Life. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any uh, documentation or statistics on this, but it was harder I was director of research for part of that time, and it was harder to recruit uh, than if we had been a private partnership. Yes. I, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I was actually an employee of Metropolitan Life. I joined Metropolitan Life uh, just shortly after the acquisition was made. And, well, you, you uh, heard me say that they had excellent employees and good employees. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did hear that. <laughs> well, they, they were good. I mean, some of them were outstanding. Yeah. And I... And I, I you know, I, I think I had, you know, looking back on my days at Metropolitan Life, it, it was an outstanding company. I think it still is. Um, you know, the integrity of that company was, you know, a, a, amazing. You know, it was a fantastic place. It was my first job out of graduate school. It was, it was a wonderful environment for someone you know, straight out of school, you know, to, to experience that professionalism and that level of integrity. But I, I do recall, you know, very strongly the sense that, um, of regret at the purchase of State Street. And I, I think the problem had nothing to do with State Street. I think it was entirely that no one had really thought through the business model. Um, if, my, if my recollection is correct, employees of State Street had been hoping to manage some of Metropolitan Life's general account assets. And, you know, the, the people at Metropolitan Life said, well, we already have an investment department. Um, and then the question was, well, then what, why did you acquire this you know, investment, uh, investment firm? Um, it was an interesting time. It was kind of a sad time to see that. I, I, I don't remember a single time anybody ever let, t telling me that, you know, this was the first mutual fund or one of the first mutual fund companies um, ever. Um, you know, I, I don't think there was that sense of history. Uh, it was kind of sad. I, I have to tell you that I managed the pension fund of the Metropolitan Life, a big chunk of the pension fund of the Metropolitan Life employees. Okay. Though we did not manage the general funds of the insurance company. We managed, uh, you know, billions of the pension fund. I see. And then eventually Metropolitan Life uh, disposed of State Street. And what did they do? Well, they sold it to BlackRock. And now it's at BlackRock. Now it's, now it was, it's been absorbed into BlackRock. It's almost disappeared. Some of the employees are still there, but mm -hmm. it's just in this mass of BlackRock. <laughs> <laughs> The book, once again, is Passion for Reality. It was just released by Columbia Business School Publishing. Michael Yogg, thanks so much for speaking with us. And there's a forward by Jack Bogle, founder of Vanguard. Which is really excellent. I, I highly recommend it. And thank you, everyone, for watching this. And thank you.